So, we're going to be moving on now to something that uh, we're both kind of like, her? <laughs> so how does this happen in the context of, yeah. of masculinity or or whatever, you know? But maybe it's just not the subject of that at all. I don't know. But um, biblical assurance. Biblical assurance. And so this is a subject that is has a lot of controversy. So maybe God's telling us that there's something inside of the masculinity part that leads into biblical assurance somehow. I not, I don't quite know. But we're, as we're talking about, you know, dominance and aggression and all, and all those other ideas, as I'm thinking about this, it's like there needs to be submission to, to God. Yes. And how do we know if you are submitted to God or not? So maybe that's exactly what we're, what, what he's leading into this is that, Submit is, is is what does it mean to be submitted to God? What is the what is the biblical assurance? Because a lot of times, you know, this is probably even more controversial than anything else. But for the for the religious spirit more than anything else, but <laughs> that's all right. Um, rebuking the name of Jesus. So anyway, um, nice. But like, um, you know, biblical assurance. So when I look at the way that people describe themselves as Christian, it's kind of like, well, I grew up in a Christian home. And I'm like, okay. And they say, I believe in God. Yes. But as scripture teaches, you know, even the demons know. Yes, and the Bible says they tremble. And they tremble, yeah. you know. They're afraid of that, yes. <laughs> but still demons. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. So, so when we're looking at that, what is the, what is the evidence? Because my passion, my passion one of my passions for ev- uh, evangelism is the fact that I went to a church, and this is not a bad church or anything like that at all. You know, it's just that I had never for real heard the gospel the entire time I was in that particular body. I grew up in as a Baptist, and so in the Baptist tradition, uh, uh, or at least in this place it was, was that basically get get a dunk in the water, and after that you know, and then after that you're saved. So I was taught that hey. Don't go to hell, Justin. Get baptized. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I got dunked in the water and then went out and started sinning again. So, so yeah. I mean, so yeah. like. Because that's how you do it. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I got, I, mean, I got baptized like at 13 years old or whatever. So, um, but as I went further on, when I was in, I just got out, graduated maybe uh, college, maybe like, I don't know, maybe four or five months out. Now I was in all kinds of trouble already and everything, you know, and, uh. And uh, that's when I truly met Christ. When I truly met him, I, I got transformed. And I was like, and I've been right since then. So, so like, uh, this, this, I knew the assurance of the fact that I had a relationship with him because I was interacting with him. I was knowing him. I was in tears over him. I was wanting more of him. I was all those type of things. And then we have the complication of those who are saying that, you know, well, uh, you need to be, the only way to be saved is to actually speak in tongues also, you know, to have the, the evidence of speaking in tongues as well, you know. But at the same time, in my experience, you know, I mean, even though it may be a little bit anecdotal, I don't know, but I loved, I loved Christ. I loved them, yeah. you know. And I see uh, passages even, in, I think, in John, either John 21 or 23, where it talks about that Jesus was saying to them that, you now have the Holy Spirit, but then it's like at the same time, he's saying that in Acts, you know, that the Holy Spirit came down in this new kind of way. Yes. So it's like you have these two different accounts, and that's kind of my account is that I got baptized. We're, by the way, we're apostolic. Oh, yeah. no. Um, but I got baptized in the Holy Spirit maybe, oh gosh, maybe five years after the fact yes. that, I, that I, when I truly knew Christ. So... It just made things clear in terms of hearing his voice and things yes. like that. It just made it a lot clearer to me, you know. But so do you have all these different kinds of rhetoric in terms of you know biblical assurance? What does that mean, you know? So because I would have hate to imagine what I was like as a man without the assurance of knowing I need to submit over to to, to God. Yes. And so when 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 I'm doing something wrong or whatever it is, I'm not trying to blame my wife for it or blame somebody else for it. I'm need to blame me. You know, like God's like have the conversation with me. What are you doing that's wrong? 
You know? So we've been throwing this word discipline around, mostly me. <laughs> and we've been talking about manhood and aggression and dominance, but we've been wrapping it in discipline and specifically biblical discipline. And I think that's healthy. Right. Right. But we're landing here now on biblical assurance, knowing that uh, if you are led by the Bible, that you can feel assured that this is a good thing. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to just read this passage. And I think this is relevant. This is First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm just going to read a few verses. So I'm going to start at verse one and then I'll jump down. So I'm going to read verse one. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Mm. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried and that he raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, I ended there at verse 4. I'm going to jump down now to verse 33. I'm going to read just two more verses. So verse 33 and 34. Okay. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right. And do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Right. So first, the biblical assurance is what Paul talks about here. Right. What what he first delivered and what he first received. That Christ died for our sins, as was necessitated by Scripture, that he was raised on the third day, as was necessitated by Scripture. Mm -hmm. Right. And that what this ultimately leads us to is the ability to grow, to live and grow in righteousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and when we are believers, when we have been baptized in water, and I'll add baptized in spirit, and I'll, I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later, so give me just a minute to get there. When we, when we have those things, we should be growing in righteousness, mm -hmm. right? And we can be biblically assured that we can be healthy men, we can be um, medicinal men, when we are standing firm on the Bible, right? Uh, talking about being baptized in the Spirit, right? Which I think is, I think is really, really important. And I, I, I lean on just a chapter earlier. So I was reading from chapter 15, but in chapter 14, Paul says, listen, I would that you would all speak in tongues. I would that you would all prophesy, right? So that, the way he talks about it, represents a healthy way of growing one another, a healthy way of speaking to one another and encouraging one another. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think that's a really, really beautiful way of describing this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It is a gift given by God to build up one another. Yeah. Right? And it is a gift that disciplines us, corrects us, rep reproves us, encourages us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... And it's like, that's why he gives in chapter 14 the model that's of correct. how to actually speak in uh, tongues or whatever. You that's know. correct. And we're not going to put a huge emphasis on tongues right now because a lot of no, people do. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, that's a, from, if you're going to rank them the way that Paul describes them in terms of rank, you know, he's like, this is like kid stuff basically. Yes. You know? So, you know, but he was saying that, you know, hey, don't all just speak in tongues, you know, because... If someone walks in and they're, and they're not about their life, they're going to be like, what, what, what's going on? You're all crazy. Yes. Yes. And so it's, if it's supposed to edify, not be about you, because one thing that I'd like to talk about sometimes is that how sin is usually geared towards selfishness. Yes. So it's not money. It's you wanting the money for yourself. Yes. It's not about, you know, uh, and that's why isolation is such a bad thing, too, because it yes. separates you from other people. So it's about the application of what God is giving to you that actually counts as sin a lot of times because he's about duplication and putting it with other people and it's not good for men to be alone and things like that. So to be selfish is to be ungodly almost. Yes. Uh, if not completely. So when we look at like the gifts and everything, when we use them selfishly like that, you know, he's like, stop that. Yes. Like, be quiet. 
make sure that you have someone who is going to be speaking in tongues or speaking in tongues towards somebody yeah. or towards the body and make sure you have someone to translate that so you're not being selfish yes. and trying to just edify yourself at that point in time. Yes. So I always like pray in tongues to myself, you know, when I'm alone. But if there is someone speaking tongues at church or whatever it is, you know, I try to make it a habit to whether or not uh, out loud or, but certainly to that person say that, you know, the Lord says, translates and says this. Yes. You know, so I'm very, very conscious and aware of that. Right. So look, I think where we land with biblical assurance is that, right, recognizing that if we trust God, we can be assured that he will not lead us astray. Yeah. I think the big fear of most people I know, especially men, is that if they trust God, he's going to have them on an island, but naked, he... with no money. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Add on to that, speaking in tongues, looking like an idiot. <laughs> And I don't think that's the I don't think that's the essence. That's not the spirit of biblical assurance. Yeah. The spirit of biblical assurance is that it makes you better. Yeah. Right? It makes you better. It improves you in every way. And so you can trust the Bible because trusting the Bible, trusting in God makes you a better, stronger, more successful, um, more uh, focused and achieved in a long term sense man. I think that's where that's where we want to land with regard to biblical assurance. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody that and this is something I struggle with sometimes, too, um, or I've struggled with in the past is that. So we have these things. Right. And it's, it's a matter of submission. Right. It's a submission to something. But you can submit yourself over to a doctrine towards a pledge. You can towards, you know, things like that, you know. So, you know, and a lot of times, too, we see. For example, the world, I'm going to classify as the world, people who are not believing in Christ to be hugely successful and and masculine and aggressive in all the right ways and everything, you know, and they're doing seemingly everything correct in terms of, you know, the lifestyle and they're successful. And I mean successful is to the point of what success actually should be defined as, which is I consistently complete my goals, you know? Yes. So, so, so. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so. You know, you look at someone like, uh, um, like a Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, a, a great example of dominance and aggression and everything that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that, absolutely all of that. His whole thing is that you know I want to o- own the New York Knicks. He nice. loves that idea. You know, swears up and down like a sailor and everything. You know, but at the same time, you know, um, as far as I know, I don't think that he's you know has any type of faith uh, at all or he kind of believes in. Something out there more. I'm not quite sure, honestly. I don't know. Yeah. But there's people like him who are completely and totally without any type of faith at all, you know, and they seem to have the same disciplines and, or submissions, you know. So what makes God necessary if you're seeing uh, people produce this kind of fruit also? If that makes sense. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. I think the question becomes where your focus is. So when I think about healthy manhood, I think about a man who makes good long-term decisions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And and I think that you're looking at really two types of people in terms of of men. I think you can look at men who focus on making short-term decisions and men who focus on making long-term decisions. Right. So there's certainly something to be said about, a man who invests well and reaps high dividends from his investment that in an earthly sense, right. In a, you know, over the span of a lifetime, maybe, or a half of a lifetime, depending upon when he starts investing and when he ends, he has made some good long-term decision in that sense. But when you look at life in perpetuity, right. So beyond just the lifespan of a foundation. Yeah. Right. When you look at life beyond the lifetime, lifespan of a foundation, but into eternity, making good long term decisions is making also not just good natural, financial, relational decisions, but also making good spiritual decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this article that I read um, did a TED talk, uh, Statistical Masculinity and Leadership in Crisis. I read from an article called Adaptive Human Behavior and Physiology. And the question in the article was, are men's religious ties hormonally regulated? Hmm. 
And so what it talked about was how men who have really high androgen is the word that they use, but it basically is a, um, the hormonal group that the testosterone um, falls into. Mm-hmm. Guys who have really, really high androgen levels, we would say guys with really high levels of testosterone, sometimes suffer from the inability to make good long-term decisions, right? They'll make short-term decisions all day, but long-term decisions is where they struggle. So the definition of a healthy man using this article, which was amazing to me, was a guy who attends church regularly, right? And a guy who has a clergy in his circle. These are men who are healthier. They make better long-term decisions because their their hormone levels are, are, are better regulated, right? And so that makes sense to me because by far and away, the best long-term decision is a godly decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly. certainly. Right, so yeah, so you can look at those guys and say they're good at making decisions, but if they haven't made the ultimate decision, right, at a certain point, right, and it may be 100 or 500 years down the road, but at a certain point, the wisdom of that decision is going to run out. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Right, and it, we would say in eternity, you know, that's a different question of whether or not that was a good or bad decision. Now, it might be a good decision here on earth, even for up to 100 or 500 years, but in eternity, right? Was that a good decision? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a that's a really sharp point in terms of um, the breadth of a decision. Yes. So it's like one one looks good within one lifetime. Yes. But... The other looks good in one lifetime and in generations to come. Yes. So look, perfect, right? So we have high regard for people who make good decisions in their lifetime. We have even more high regard for people who make good decisions that affect their children Mm -hmm. and even more high regard for people who make good decisions that affect their children and their grandchildren. Right. But again, by far and away, the highest regard we have for people who make good decisions that last into eternity. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I think about that in light of, uh, I guess in light of just that, what the Bible talks about in terms of certain curses and certain things be passed down to the second and third generation, you yes. know? And, or, we actually look at two. Sometimes the children of, you know, celebrities. So mm-hmm. they've done the work, right? But then the children sometimes are left with, okay, you found something, but I haven't found that something that you found. Yes. And a lot of times because of that leisurely kind of living, you know, in terms of you know the more uh, affluent lifestyle and everything, you know, and because they never were taught to really get it themselves or we're not permitted to get it themselves because I want because yeah. because of the attitude of you know I want to give my children the world yes. which sounds good on paper yes or, but, or or they didn't need to get it themselves I mean if right. you, you got a, you know a bozillion dollars in the bank <laughs> why are we working at McDonald's over the summer <laughs> <laughs> right right exactly so you know I think that's an interesting thing that that happens now I think that a lot of times people who are have wealth know better than that. You know, yes. but then sometimes they just straight up didn't or don't. And you see those children kind of begin to work in something, you know, other than what they've got. I remember one time, I'll never forget this. I saw an interview with Brad Pitt and they're playing at a church. And and this is Brad Pitt we're talking about, you know. Yes. So he's got the money, the charisma, the career, the wife, the kid, all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And he was saying that something's missing. And hmm. the guy was like, you're Brad Pitt. What, what, you had all the money and fame and fortune in the world. What, what could be missing? He's like, I'm telling you, man. He was adamant about this. He's like, I'm telling you, this ain't it. Yeah. This ain't it. Yeah, man. Yeah. So that goes back into two things, actually. Then we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Even though I don't want to, because it's great. <laughs> this is really uh, good. Yeah. I have to say. <laughs> but um, two things. There is, when I was trying to find God, and I was trying to find him in a lot of existential ideas, so I believe, for example, that 
maybe Jesus was the guy who unlocked, who somehow unlocked, you know, the other parts of his brain, you know what I'm saying? Like, I thought it was kind of weird thing like that. Like, like uh, what was that movie called? Um, um, Lucy. <laughs> I thought that yes, stuff like Jesus that, you is, know? Yeah, Jesus is like Scarlett Johansson. I got it. <laughs> right. Just not as good looking. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. So, I was mean, thinking things like that, you know. I was thinking all kinds of weird, like, existential ideas about, you know, who was... Who was this guy, and who is God, and what is God, and make it find him in science, and or meta, other metaphysics, and things like that. Um, like I even tried, for example, things like astral projection. I went to a screen, a, a screen, a, a school of um, of uh, metaphysics, you know, things mm-hmm. like that. I went to all kind of uh, wow. stuff like that. So like, um, I was doing all these things, you know. And when I found the the night, the night that I knew Christ, and I knew, and I confessed Him to be, and repented my sin, and re- yep. confessed Him to be Lord and Savior, deep in my heart, when I actually did that for real, when I was ready to stop running and try to try to for real find Him and nail Him down, um, you know, that's a bad terminology, but you know what I'm trying to say. So like, when I for real found Him, that hole, that something I was looking for, filled instantly. For the first time in my life, I yes. was like, oh, oh, it was him. It was the very thing yes. I was raised in and I was running from yes. the whole time. Yep. See, yes. Yeah. See, th- this is why, again, we don't begrudge people who make good financial decisions and especially people who make good long-term financial decisions. But let's not confuse good decision making in that way with the same thing as filling a void. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to put that, it. That's, that's a good decision. Yes. But that does not necessarily fill a void. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause if that, if that filled a void, right, there would be no drug and alcohol abuse in those communities. True. There would be no spousal abuse, no sexual abuse in those communities. Right. No suicide. No suicide, no depression. Their kids would be, right, their kids would be examples of their parents. So they would also live these exemplary lives because their parents had figured it out and were able to pass that figuring it out onto their kids. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you know, we, we say without judgment for the success that they have and say we say humbly because of the success that you've had, congratulations. But there can still be a void that needs to be filled. And the only way to fill that in any appreciable way is to make the best long-term decision ever. Choose God. Yeah. Right. Specifically, choose Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. And there's been people like Sean Bowles who have talked about, you know, how he's in front of like billionaires, you know. Yes. And he'll give them a word and they'll be weeping over that word. Yes. And then he'll just... I think he said he gave he gave um he got the bank account number to this one guy <laughs> or something like that in the past or something crazy like that you know the Lord had given it to him you know just to let him know that you know I'm real <laughs> and he gave life to Christ and everything you know and so so you know but the last thing I want to touch on to the biblical assurance too uh, this is the doozy this is the convicting part right here I think is that biblical assurance means that there is victory yeah. yeah. It means that there is victory, period. Yes, that's correct. So, and then we look at the culture of Chris, Chris, Christendom sometimes, you know, and it looks pretty bleh sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Most I, of the time. I can grant you that. Yeah. And... When we look at the passages and we talk about the thing that we started talking about in terms of, you know, biblically speaking, the men are supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z, you know, within discipline, within control, within those type of things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then how come, you know, and also joining that with biblical assurance of submission and also the victory of Christ and knowing what that actually is now. What's the deal with not taking the risks? Because if this is it risk, if we know that, for example, okay, God's called me to this. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to go through that without strife and or or, or some kind of you know um, some kind of trouble because no one in the Bible went through didn't go through that. You know what I'm saying? Like Jesus went through some stuff too. So. 
this this idea that I can play it safe and not go into the calling of God seems like sin to me because and this is me just thinking out loud too but because like God's calling people and men and women and everything to to ministry and everything and I thought that sin was disobedience from God correct yes <laughs> so if you're going to say that well I don't lie I don't cheat I don't steal I don't do this you know you kind of sound like the rich young ruler to me you know so you sound like you know that you have this righteousness about you and yet when Jesus gave him a commandment to go and to sell this you know, it wasn't about him selling the stuff. It's about the commandment to do it. So, and then he walks away sad. I find that with a lot of, especially Christian men, we're talking about masculinity again. A lot of men walk away sad. Yeah. So I've got one for you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Book of Joshua, chapter one. I'm going to start at verse one. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Mm -mm. The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am going to give them. Right? Excuse me, the land I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse six. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Now, I find that what is missing in Christendom today is some translations call it good courage. Yeah. Right. It's not that we don't have a plan. It's not that we don't know what God has called us to. It's not that we don't have proper education. It is not in any appreciable way, any lack of money. It's not a lack of mentorship or pastoring or discipline. It is a lack of good courage. Yeah. yeah. That's what's missing. And so God says it here two times. Be strong and very courageous. Only be strong very courageous because if you don't have courage then all the best laid plans are a waste yeah. right they become a mental exercise in futility yeah yep i've heard about that before you you gotta have a fighting spirit about you yes <laughs> yeah no two ways yeah. no two ways yeah. and all that aggression that we talked about all everything we just talked about that yeah. leads into you know yes right so what we often see are men who are aggressive but cowardly hmm. wow right the bible calls us to be aggressive but courageous hmm. right and it takes courage to be aggressive and disciplined yeah yeah that's hard right yes come on <laughs> tell me hard. about it <laughs> <laughs> right which is why god had to say it twice be courageous only be very courageous yeah. Yeah. Like, really all that's missing from my brothers in christ good courage that's it hmm. yeah. okay okay all right so then we're going to end the first episode on on that note right there and Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that very, very much. Absolutely. You'll probably get it in parts, so listen to all of them. <laughs> right, so I'll probably put up, you know, the ones that kind of go up first, and then that will have the long one. So, because, um, you know, it's kind of good to, to keep things in sections sometimes, you know, so it that's is. kind of a nice thing. Uh, but, in any case, thank you guys for listening very much. You can find out ways to support this stuff on the in the links in the description below. Uh, there'll be a link to uh, websites, Patreons, yep. Uh, uh, yep. YouTube videos, sort of yep. stuff. 
uh, Pastor Keith here, things like that, you know, yep. so as they come out, because yep. the TED Talk isn't out quite yet. So. TED Talk isn't out yet, but you can find me on YouTube, Shamar Keith, S-H-I-M-A-R. We're on Facebook, at Feasts with an S of God Church. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at Keith Shamar, S-H-I-M-A-R. All right, and plus you guys already know who I am, so <laughs> well, some of you, some of you don't. Like I said, links are going to be in the description below about everything else that this channel does and everything, and the mission and the art ministry that I have, and that'll be that. So um, we'll go ahead and see you guys next time, and uh, let's go ahead and pray, pray out for the for the good folks. You want to do that? Speak a blessing over them, maybe or something like that. Be glad to, Lord. We thank you for all the great things that you have done. We just want to speak life and blessings over men right now, Lord. We thank you mm -hmm. for masculinity. We thank you for testosterone. We thank you for the minds that we have, the urges that we have, even the ones that sometimes seem like a distraction. But we know that you only give blessings, Father. So we thank you for everything that you've given us. Yes. But we even thank you and especially thank you for discipline and courage. Yeah. Father, thank you for the Bible and the biblical assurance that we have as believers. And if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who is not a believer, Father, I pray for a hunger for you to start arising in their heart right now. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Name. Right. Let them be desperate yeah. for manhood, biblical manhood. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, we just want to speak life. Mm -hmm. we, we touch the visions and dreams of every believer. We call it alive and done. Yeah. We breathe the Holy Spirit on it. Yes, Lord. We say, Lord, do your work. Use men through your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Complete and total agreement with that. All right, guys. Lord willing, catch y'all next week. And that's that.